Hello and welcome, dear saints of St. Peter Evangelical Lutheran Church, as well as all of our dear brothers and sisters in Christ who are joining us here today. Uh, well, we're back at it again here on this Tuesday, December 1st, as again we have the great joy of going through our treasury of daily prayer as we let the Word of God dwell within us richly. And so, as we always do here with our Treasury of Daily Prayer, we'll begin our devotion here today with a psalm. And today, uh, our psalm comes from Psalm 34. In particular, we'll read today verses 11 to 18. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And there's the end of our psalm. And so as we normally do here with our readings, we see a theme that we're going to see in our readings here today uh, in this psalm. And in particular, it is that theme of the Lord looking on the righteous, but looking away from the evil. And here we, we should really mention, when, when the Bible talks this way, when, when the scriptures will speak of the Lord favoring the righteous, it, it doesn't mean those who do a bunch of good things here in this world. Now, what it means to be righteous, as Scripture there, kind of turns over. Uh, we, we aren't really following along where we had been the last few weeks. We start fresh, uh, new books. And so today, uh, we are starting the book of Isaiah. And we're going to pick up here in the book of Isaiah with chapter 7 and read the, the last half of that in the first half of chapter 8. So just a quick little uh, kind of get up to speed here in the book of Isaiah here at the very beginning of the book, we see Isaiah commissioned. Uh, the Lord calls him. He sends him to be his prophet. And part of this is where the Lord uh, really gives Isaiah a vision of heaven. He brings him before the heavenly throne and he shows him uh, really who he is, who the Lord is. And it ends with that, those famous words from Isaiah uh, the, where the Lord says, Who shall go for us and who shall we send? And Isaiah says, Here I am, send me. Now, it's right at this point then, where in the beginning of chapter 7, Isaiah is sent uh, to King Ahaz. He is the king of Judah. Finish with verse 8. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For, the, for before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for you to become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. Then the Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters, belonging to Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. And I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest, and Zechariah the son of Jeperekiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. And there is the end of our reading. And so, as we see here in this reading, uh, we see 
the Lord, it starts off with the Lord speaking to King Ahaz. Ahaz is there and, and the Lord has already told him, ask for a sign, right? Ask for anything and I will give it. Well, Ahaz, he then says those famous words that, that almost everyone seems to know. He says, I won't ask for a sign. I won't put the Lord to the test. And yet, when we hear those words, we think, oh, well, well, that's a good response. We aren't to test the Lord. We aren't going to ask for something the Lord hasn't promised. But the Lord sees right through it. This is not a, a pious request or a pious statement from Ahaz. Rather, this is a statement that is born out of unbelief. Uh, this is Ahaz as, as he's sitting here saying, basically, I don't believe in this, this God, this Lord who is speaking for. And so he will not ask a thing from him. Well, the Lord, as I said, sees right through this. And so he says, well, I'll give you a sign then. If you won't ask for one, I'll give it to you. I'll, tell, I'll show you that I am the Lord. And what is that sign? Well, very appropriate uh, for the season we're, we're in right now and, and for the day we're all looking forward to uh, near the end of this month. That sign is that the virgin will conceive and bear a son. As the Lord then says, here is the sign. It is the sign for Ahaz, but it is a sign for us as well. It is a sign that indeed the Lord is working to fulfill all his promises. Now, from this point then, in the rest of our reading, the Lord will kind of show this by really pointing ahead to something that will happen to that land of Judah, to the nation of Israel in a very short time. Uh, you kind of heard it throughout the rest of the reading, that the Lord kept mentioning the king of Assyria or, or Assyria or the nations coming against you. And that's because the Lord is showing him uh, that as that promise of the Messiah has just been given to him, right? That, that the Messiah will come and save his people. Well, so it will be also played at a smaller scale, right? Uh, for the nation of Israel, that the Lord, as, as it says here, he will bring upon that, that land of Israel those kings whom Israel is afraid of. And, and he will destroy the land of Israel. They will be taken away, led captive from their land. But the Lord will then deliver them. Right? You heard this all the way through. That it speaks about how the Lord is calling in Assyria. And he'll shave Israel in a few short years. He is showing them what the Messiah himself will come to do. Uh, that the Messiah will come and rescue God's people who have been led captive into sin. And he will bring us back. You know, and, and as that then happened in the nation of Israel, as it happened in history, that Assyria comes and destroys that southern kingdom of Israel and takes the people away captive. Well, what happened then? The Lord brought them back. He sent them back to the land once more. And so even so, the Emmanuel, that child born of the virgin, the promise, the sign itself, he will do this on a much grander scale. He will lead all of us who are captive in our His name, Emmanuel. The other sign, though, is the sign that Ahaz will see. A sign that all the nation, all the people of those days would see. And that is the king of Assyria rising up. And so when we see this happen, when we see Assyria uh, as it takes Israel captive, it is really a reminder that God's promises are coming true. That his Messiah is coming and that we all will be saved because of him. Because of that little boy uh, who is called Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, God with us. Now from this point then, having given these kind of two signs uh, to the people, then we have this little interesting section that begins chapter 8, where the Lord then says uh, to Isaiah, write this on a tablet, make it plain and obvious, and it says, Con belonging to Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Now, this is a, a Hebrew name, but as with almost every Hebrew name, there's a meaning behind this. And so what that word, before this boy, before he'll, he'll know how to cry out my mom, my dad, right? Any of this stuff, 
the wealth of Damascus, the spoil of Samaria. There's that play on his name, right? It'll be carried away before the king of Israel, or Assyria rather, the king of Assyria. And so again, this is much like what the Lord had said to Ahaz, but now it's being played out in the life of Isaiah, that for his son uh, that he has, the spoil of the nation of Israel will be taken away. And that prey of Israel, it'll, it'll be hastened uh, into Assyria. But then the Lord, he, he doesn't stop here. He's showing them that this is going to happen. But then as, that, as those verses end, the Lord says, this is all because my people have forsaken me. And yet I will raise up the river, he says here. Kind of a, a foreshadowing of baptism, if you will. I will raise up the river and I will bring my people back, right? And notice how he says this. Its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. And there the Lord is connecting there for Isaiah the birth of his son, Mahir Shalal Hashbaz, to the Messiah. And how that birth of that child who will be carried away into captivity but brought back into the land will find its ultimate fulfillment in Emmanuel, the boy born of the virgin who then ransoms, who brings back all of God's people, not just Israel, but all people uh, who believe. Verse 22. And we'll just kind of jump right on in. It, it's kind of a good point in the book that you can enter in and, and understand what Peter is writing about. So we'll read here from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 22. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for those to who for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, 
in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And there's the end of our reading. So this reading starts off, as we've seen Paul and, and others do in Scripture, by speaking about the relationship between husbands and wives. And, and we see here kind of two things at play. First off, why does Scripture bring this up several times? How, how do wives and husbands uh, interact with one another? Well, the reason is because this is a picture of who we are uh, as believers with uh, Christ. That Christ is our husband right? We as the church are his bride. And so we are in this marital union with our Lord, the church, the bride, and, and Christ, the bridegroom. And so when we understand that relationship rightly, how Christ lays down his life for us, his bride, and as his bride, we, we submit to him in everything because we know he will only do what, those things that are good for us, that he will always act out of love for us. Well, then scripture says, let's Let's take that relationship and let's let that guide our relationships here. How ought husbands and wives interact with one another? And so Peter, he begins uh, by talking to the wives. And he says, be, uh, you know, su be subject to your own husbands. And again, this doesn't mean, all right, place yourself underneath him and he, you have to do everything he says no matter what. No, that's not what it says. Instead, this is about having that good order. As the church is subject to Christ, well, then wives also are subject to husbands. But notice Peter brings up something really interesting here in the next verse, right? Or in the, in the rest of that verse. He, uh, he says, so that even if some of your husbands may not be Christian, right? Even if they don't obey the word, well, then maybe you would convert them by your conduct. By, in other words, living as a Christian, Right? And so as he says this, what Paul is getting at is this is the Christian way to live, right? Uh, to, to be subject, to take your place under the husband as Christ does, or as the church does, rather, to Christ, right? Out of love and respect. This isn't about who's better and who's worse. Not at all, right? Peter and, and Paul and others are not saying that women are, are less than men when they put it this way. Rather, they are speaking about how we are reflecting that relationship we have with Christ our Lord. And so as he says then, right, that by their conduct, maybe this will convert an unbelieving husband, right? And so then he goes on and he speaks about uh, for wives, therefore adorn yourselves, not with, with gold and, and jewelry and all these things, but rather he says with a good conduct, right? Uh, as he says, the hidden person of the heart, imperishable beauty is there, right? And this is precious in the sight of God. Now, when Peter says this, he's not saying you can't wear jewelry or, or you can't wear a nice dress or, or have makeup. No, that's not what he means. But what he's saying is, uh, as as for all Christians, right? The what How we really adorn ourselves is with our works, is with how we live, right? This isn't how we're saved, but but this is what our faith does. It acts out in this world. It, it loves our neighbor. It, it submits to our neighbor. It shows our neighbor that love first has shown us. And so Paul reminds us what makes us beautiful is not what we put on the outside. No, what makes us beautiful in the sight of God is what's inside. Is that faith that he creates in us and then that faith which manifests itself in these good works. And so Peter reminds us of that here. We're not beautiful because of the outside. We're beautiful because of that faith that God has given us. And so he reminds wives of that very thing, that your outward beauty is not what makes you precious in the sight of God or even in the sight of your husband, but it is uh, that faith living out uh, actively, living in those good works that faith produces. And so, as it says, then uh, he wraps this up by saying, yes, you Christian women, you Christian wives, you are daughters of Sarah, right? The, the wife of Abraham who loved her husband and did all of these things. And so he says, do not fear anything then, 
right? You have nothing to fear because you are those daughters of Sarah, which means you are the daughters of God. Well, having said this to the wives, and we always want to make sure we put these together, now we hear what, what Peter says to the husbands, right? Because this, again, shows us that, that the, well, Peter and Paul and others are not, are not telling women to, to just submit and act like you're, you're second class or that husbands are greater. That's not what they're saying at all, right? No, instead, Peter goes right into what a husband ought to do, right? And so he says, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman. And here we see very much like what Paul says too, that what is the husband to do? He is to be like Christ. Uh, he is to understand what his wife needs and, and what she wants and, and, and who she is. And he is to honor her. He is to love her. He is to do everything he can for her. Now, right after this, though, we get this phrase that, that sometimes people really don't like, but, but we just need to it's really understand what Peter is saying here, because he's saying something that actually, first off, is true, but secondly, just really reinforces this all the more. So he says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, again, this is where people will have a misunderstanding that he is saying somehow women are, are weak and, and fragile and, and they must be protected and, and all this kind of stuff. And that flies in the face of, of what the world tries to teach here as well. But that's not what Paul, or Peter rather, that's not what he's trying to say when he says this. Instead, he's really merely stating the fact that typically a man is going to be bigger and stronger than his wife. Not always, but typically. And so what's he saying? Don't use this as an advantage. Don't use this against your wife. Even though you are bigger and stronger, will show her that love, that honor, that respect that she is due. Because, right, the sentence doesn't end here. There's a very important part right after this that shows us in no way is Peter saying women are worse than men. Because he says the very next words, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Heirs with you. Such an important point here that when he is speaking about weaker vessel, he is simply saying uh, the, the objective reality that men tend to be, not always, but tend to be stronger, bigger, uh, larger than their wives, but they should not use this to hurt their wives. They should use this to love their wives, to honor them, uh, to do everything they can out of love for them. And so, as he says then, why? Because each and every one of us, husbands or wives, doesn't matter, men or women or children, all of us are heirs of that life that God gives us. All of us are heirs of Christ and his grace and his mercy. And so how ought husbands and wives to live with each other? Well, they should live in this way. Husbands loving their wives, even to the point of laying down their life for them, honoring their wives in everything that they do. And wives then living in, uh, in a respect of their husbands, uh, submitting as the Bible says, not how it always works. And yet we pray that it would be. And this is the way uh, that marriage has been created because this is how Christ relates to all of us as his church. And so again, you know, the world wants to twist these words all out of sorts and, and, and throw them into context where they don't belong. But instead, when we read this as it truly is, we see what a wonderful message this is. Not only of who we are as the church in relation to Christ, but then how that relationship, that salvation that is ours, can play itself out in our relationships in this world in such a beautiful way. And so, as Paul says all of this, then he, he transitions. He says, finally, right? Finally, all of you, right? Now that we've established this most crucial relationship, what about everyone else? Well, he says, have the same mind, have sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, right? All this kind of stuff. And don't repay evil for evil, right? Turn the other cheek, as Jesus will say. And he goes then into Psalm 34, which we heard at the beginning of our devotion here today, that the Lord uh, has favor for the righteous, but the Lord does not look on those who do evil. And so as he then says, well then, if we should suffer, should we suffer for doing what's good? 
the righteous one for the unrighteous in order that we may be alive. Right, And as he says, as Christ suffered, he even descends into hell for us. And he preaches his victory over death in the grave. And this is where we get this beautiful line where he says, Baptism, which corresponds to all of this, to Christ's death and his resurrection. Well, this now saves us. Right, Baptism now saves you. Why? Well, he says, not because it washes dirt off your body, but because it makes you a child of God. It joins you to the death and the resurrection of Christ. And going back all the way to the beginning with husbands and wives, when this happens, when we're baptized into Christ, it changes everything. It changes how we live in this world because we know that our Lord suffered and died for us, that he saved us, uh, that he even rose again to give us that promise of the resurrected life. And so, uh, truly, there's much more that we could dive into here with this uh, this First Peter reading. Uh, but I think that's a really good place for us to end to see how uh, this baptism, right, that we have into Christ, how it changes everything, uh, everything that we think, everything that we do here in this world. And so, there is the end of our our New Testament reading there from First Peter chapter three. Now with that, uh, we'll move into our writing here. And today, uh, we get to have a writing from the large catechism of Martin Luther, where he's going to expound on holy baptism just a little bit more here, uh, as we just heard it there in Peter. And so here's our writing from the large catechism. Our baptism abides forever. Even though someone should fall from baptism and sin, still we always have access to it. So we may subdue the old man again, but we do not need to be sprinkled with water again. Even if we were put under the water a hundred times, it would still be only one baptism, even though the work and sign continue and remain. Repentance, therefore, is nothing other than a return and approach to baptism. We repeat and do what we began before, but abandoned. I say this, lest we fall into the opinion in which we were stuck for a long time. We were imagining that our baptism is something past, which we can no longer use after we have fallen again into sin. The reason for this is that baptism is regarded as only based on the outward act once performed and completed. This arose from the fact that St. Jerome wrote that repentance is the second plank by which we must swim forth and cross over the water after the ship is broken, on which we step and are carried across when we come into the Christian church. By this teaching, baptism's use has been abolished so that it can no longer profit us. Therefore, Jerome's statement is not correct, or at any rate, it is not understood. For the ship of baptism never breaks because it is God's ordinance and not our work. 1 Peter 3. But it does happen, indeed, that we slip and fall out of the ship. Yet if anyone falls out, let him see to it that he swims up and clings to the ship until he comes into it again and lives in it as he had done before. In this way, one sees what a great, excellent thing baptism is. It delivers us from the writing. And so, as Luther says here, uh, what is baptism? What, what is all of this uh, that we talk about with holy baptism? Well, he starts off by reminding us there is only one holy baptism. Even if we were to baptize time and time and time and time again, well, the first one was all we needed, right? The first baptism gave us the kingdom of God and all of these great things. And he says, so even though we slip into sin, even though we fall uh, away from our baptism, we fall into the evil of this world, we don't need baptism again. It's still there for us. Rather, Luther says, what we need now is repentance. Because repentance is nothing more than going right back to our baptism and saying, yes, this is still valid. This still is forgiving me and making me a child of God. Uh, and so then he, he goes into this quote that St. Jerome had about a ship, right? That in baptism, we're, we're put in the ship, but when we sin, boy, that, that ship hits a rock, it splits up, and we have to cl uh, hang on to a plank, right, of wood until we can get into a new ship, right? And he says, well, this, this isn't right at all, right? This is not what baptism is. Rather, Luther says, baptism 
is like a ship that can never break. No matter what kind of a rock it might run into, the ship of baptism will never be broken. In other words, our baptism can never be taken away from us. But, Luther says, it, it might happen, and indeed it does happen, that sometimes we fall out of the ship. Or maybe we could say we jump out of the ship, right? We do it intentionally. Well, when that happens and when we hit the water and we realize what happened, what does Luther say? Well, then we go back. We swim once more to that ship of our baptism. We grab hold of it and we let God bring us back in, right? As he says, then we're brought back into the ship to live once more. And so as he says, this is the way we ought to see our baptism, not as something past that we have no access to, but as a present reality that is ours. His grace, his mercy, they are always ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so a, a really a comforting passage, a, a remarkable passage there from the large catechism that reminds us just what a gift our baptism really is, that it is indeed with us all of our days. Now with that, uh, we'll bring our devotion here to a close. And we do that first uh, with our hymn stanza. And we get a hymn from a great Advent hymn here, or a Christmas hymn rather, All My Heart Again Rejoices. This is LSB 360, and we'll read here stanza four. See the Lamb, our sin once taking, to the cross. 